Dr. Florence, good morning. Good morning, Chief. You presenting today? Oh, that'll be so nice. Yeah, so I'll try. I'm just trying my best. I hope it comes out well. I just want oh. to do it and know that I'm done. Oh, it will. It will. It will. It will. Don't worry, I'm behind you. I'm, I'm behind you. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You have you have the floor now, so you can you can start your presentation. Okay. Um. Good morning, senior colleagues and colleagues. Um. I'll be taking us today on question number four of um October twenty twenty three um West Africa College of Physician question. So um, the question goes this way. A sixty three year old man was referred to you on account of progressive renal insufficiency over the past three months, associated with occasional dependent edema. He is a known hypertensive for over 20 years with fairly well-controlled blood pressure over the past three months and has been suffering from malaise and back pain, for which he has taken various analgesics he recently had a febrile illness for which he was treated with antibiotics and antimalarial medication. Investigations revealed elevated creatinine of 225 micromole per liter. Sodium, with, sodium was within normal of 146 uh, millimole per liter. Um, normal potassium of 4.1 millimole per liter. He had metabolic acidosis of 22 millimole per liter. Hyperkalemia of hypercalcemia of 2.8 millimole per liter, hypophosphatemia of 2 millimoles per liter, hyperuricemia of 6.6 .6 micromole per liter, anemia of um, HB of 7.5 gram per liter, um, WBC of 5.3 times 10 raised to power 9, and um, thrombocytopenia of um, 68 times 10 raised to power 12. 
Urinalysis revealed proteinuria of four pluses, hematuria of one plus, and um, a granular cast. A. Mention five possible causes of renal insufficiency in these patients. So A. So um, number one, um, I thought of hypertension in this patient because hypertension is one of the commonest um, causes of um, renal impairment, especially this is a patient who has had renal insufficiency for over past the past three months of which um, chronic kidney disease um, can be defined as um, renal insufficiency of, of um, or renal um, insufficiency or functional renal um, dysfunction of over three months and above. So um, I thought of hypertension first. And again, too, he's been hypertensive for over 20 years and the blood pressure has been fairly controlled. So I thought of hypertension as one of the causes of the renal insufficiency. Number two, I thought of multiple myeloma. The reason being um, the age range is 63. In Nigeria, the mean age for multiple myeloma is within 45 to 62, 63 years. It's commoner in males, of which is a male. Then he had um, a history of um, back pain, which is bone pain. Uh, they have the pneumonic crab. So he had um, bone pain. And then um, also he had um, hypercalcemia, which is also the anemia, which he also presented with anemia of 7.5. And um, also renal involvement, of which he said um, he presented with renal insufficiency of over three months. Then thirdly, I thought of an NSAID-induced um, nephropathy. He's been on analgesics on and off, like for a long time, for over uh, the period of three months, he's been having this um, renal insufficiency alongside with the backbone. So we all know that I, I was thinking the analgesic in quotes would be um, NSAID because NSAIDs are um, cy 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 cyclooxygenase inhibitor of which um, um, they produce, um, it's a prostaglandin analog, of which we all know that prostaglandin is a vasodilator that dilates the arterioles, the efferent and the afferent um, um, arterioles leading to vasodilation. So in using NSAID, NSAID is actually an inhibitor. So it inhibits that vasodilatory effect, thereby predisposing this patient to hypoperfusion. So the patient will, be, um, will come down with um, renal hypoperfusion that can predispose this patient to an AKI on probably background um, CKD. Then thirdly, I thought of sepsis. Um, the patient has had a um, febrile illness um, of which um, he, he was treated with antibiotics and um, anti-malarial. So sepsis can also predispose um, a patient to AKI with um, a background um, chronic kidney disease. Then um, uh, the fifth is um, amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is also common in this age range. And when the amyloid um, um, proteins deposits on the bone, it can, the patient can still present with bone pain. It deposits on um, the kidneys, that's the glomerular tufts or the basement membrane. The patient can also present with um, features suggestive of um, renal insufficiency. And then to do, give us a picture of um, proteinuria as well. Then I also thought of um, nephrolithiasis. Nephrolithiasis um, being um, um, backed up with um, hypercalcemia of um, 2.8 uh, millimole per liter. So um, we all know that hypercalcemia can predispose one to um, a renal, um, renal stones. And um, here the um, hypercalcemia came from um, osteoclastic um, uh, um, bone lesion of which there was increased bone resorption and then calcium was released from the bone into um, the blood and then predisposed this patient to um, hypercalcemia that can lead to nephrolithiasis. So these are um, the possible five um, causes of um, renal insufficiency in this patient. So um, the B option, what is the most likely diagnosis? From all what I listed, um, um, my topmost is multiple myeloma, of which um, I said because of the age range, um, he's males, common nine males. And then also he presented with the crab uh, features of hypercalcemia, renal involvement, anemia, as well as bone pain. Then um, the next question is, which least additional investigations 
expected and expected findings you will carry out to confirm the diagnosis in this patient. So um, I would want to do um, a bone marrow biopsy. Um, we all know that um, multiple myeloma is a plasma cell dyscrasia, um, of which when we do a bone marrow um, biopsy, we would see more than 10% um, of um, abnormal plasma cells in the bone marrow. So I would do that, and that's what is going to uh, reveal. The renal biopsy has been said to be a diagnostic, of which we can see um, uh, cast nephropathy in 43% of the cases, and then um, light chain amyloidosis of so 7 to 30% of the cases, you will see um, light chain amyloidosis, as well as um, monoclonal immunoglobulin um, deposition um, disease with um, uh, mesangial perforative glomerulonephritis um, pattern in 16 to 26% of cases when a renal biopsy is being done. Other investigations that would help would be um, elect um, erythro erythrocyte sedimentation rates of which it to be elevated because this is actually a chronic state, a chronic disease. Then also we would do, I would want to do um, a serum um, protein electrophoresis and it will demonstrate an M protein band spike when we do that. Then also, um, there's a room for urine and serum and free light chain, um, of which there will be an abnormal um, free light chain ratio. Uh, a peripheral blood film will be beneficial for this patient, of which uh, we will see what we call the rollo rollo formation. This actually occurs uh, because the plasma cells are abnormally formed and their shapes are not in the regular pattern. So they are kind of sluggish in moving. And um, what happens is that they begin to stick to one another because their shapes are irregularly um, formed. And then they form this um, chain-like um, um, appearance, which is called the roller formation. Then um, it's, um, the peripheral blood film would um, 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 show us a picture of um, depression of the tree cell line where we'll come down, the patient will come down with um, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and also leukoerythroblastic picture. A 24 urinary protein will be done on this patient of which to reveal an um, nephritic range of which is a patient had. And we'll also do urine albumin creatinine ratio to detect um, um, if the, detect the early stage of um, the kidney disease. Then serum lactate um, dehydrogenase will be elevated, most likely it's elevated in um, uh, malignant states of which uh, multiple myeloma is a cancerous state, is elevated in um, uh, mitotic um, lesions. Then also serum um, albumin and beta-2 macroglobulin has been said to be prognostic. We, we actually use it to, um, um, which is an indicative of severity of the multiple myeloma. Uh, when you notice hypoalbuminemia, it indicates that the severity of the multiple myeloma is actually more. And then when the beta-2, the higher the beta-2 beta macroglobulin, the poorer the prognosis. So it's been used to prognosticate this patient. This patient will also benefit from a magnetic resonance imaging of the spine of which it will reveal osteotic lesion and um, we also see osteoporosis and then fracture in this patient. So now the next question is, what three uh, renal lesion could be associated with this condition? Number one, we have cast nephropathy. It's, it's been said to occur in 40 to 63% of um, um, cases with um, alongside with multiple myeloma. Um, secondly, amyloid light chain amyloidosis, uh, which also has a nephritic syndrome pattern. It's been said to be associated with multiple myeloma within them um, seven to thirty percent of um, um, cases, and also monoclonal immunoglobulin deposition disease has been said to be associated with multiple myeloma in nineteen to twenty six um, percent of cases. Then we also have the Fanconi's um, syndrome. The Fanconi syndrome has been said to worsen, um, helps to precipitate. Um, the MGOS um, states down to the multiple myeloma states. It has also been said to be associated with multiple myeloma. Then also nephrolithiasis has also been said to be associated with um, multiple myeloma. How would you manage this patient? 
um, um, it's actually, we're going to use a multidisciplinary approach where we're going to involve the nephrologist of which this patient already has, has been down with um, three months um, history of renal insufficiency, the hematologist, uh, because this is actually plasma cell dyscrasia, um, the orthopedic surgeon, the patient has been presenting with um, um, back pain. So we need the orthopedic surgeon, um, if, uh, peradventure there's a compressive lesion or there's a fracture for the orthopedic surgeon to take care of that. Then the pharmacist, to help um, bring the um, to help us with the immunomodulators, the proteasome uh, inhibitors, and also the steroids, the drugs that will be used. And these patients will need a good nursing care because some of them may be bed bound due to fracture. So we need the help of the nurses, the lab scientists, as well as um, the blood bank um, scientists, of which will be beneficial in helping us in um, 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 blood uh, and all. So um, in, in, in managing the patient furthermore, um, would want to do it, want to monitor fluid inputs and outputs to try to make sure this patient um, is, has not gone into AKI. And um, basically what this patient needs is liberal fluid intake. Liberal fluid intake that will help to um, help us to excrete the, um, those light chain and, and immunoglobulins to help to excrete it into the urine. And also this patient is hypercalcemic. So the liberal fluid um, intake would also help to um, excrete the excessive calcium to prevent stone formation. Then also um, this patient um, was actually um, anemic with a HV of 7.6. This patient would benefit from um, blood product um, replace. Um, when necessary, we can give packed cells, platelets, erythropoietin, depending on what exactly. He was actually um, thrombocytopenic, so he can get platelet concentrates. And um, also erythropoietin has been said to be beneficial since there's bone marrow involvement and then it's responsible for the red cell production. Then we'll correct the hypercalcemia by hydration, steroids, and it has been said that 80% of the time, bisphos uh, bisphosphonate has been said to um, take good care of the hypercalcemic states. Then also in correcting the hyperuricemia, this patient would benefit from hydration, patients would benefit from xanthine oxidase, and to be specific, would benefit from febuzostats. Um, then we'll treat the infection and also prevent um, um, venous thromboembolism. We all know that um, chronic kidney, uh, kidney disease is actually a hypercoagulable state. So we'll just give, uh, we'll give um, prophylaxis for venous thromboembolism to prevent the formation of thrombosis. Then um, we avoid nephrotoxic drugs because already the patient has a renal impairment to prevent further worsening. For specific treatment, this patient will benefit from getting um, proteosome um, inhibitor of which um, we have the botezomib. Um, botezomib is actually given to the patient on day one, day four, day eight, and day 11. And um, the patient will also benefit from is actually um, a combination therapy, although it's, it depends on how frail this patient is, whether the patient gets a monotherapy, a bi-therapy, or complete combination. The patient will also benefit from lenadomide, which is um, an immunomodulator, going fully well, that is the plasma cell that's actually involved, that's, and, and then is responsible for production of antibodies. So we know that since the plasma cells are actually abnormally formed, this patient will be predisposed to infections. So the patient will benefit from immune, immunomodulator like the lenad, lenadomide. Then also, uh, lenadomide is actually taken for um, four weeks. But if there's a relapse, the patient will benefit from thalidomide. We'll step up higher to thalidomide. And then um, the exametazone will be beneficial. So the melphalan cyclophosphamide is actually replaced with the um, lenadomide if not available. Um, plasma exchange, um, patients will benefit from that. In, hyperviscosity syndrome. You know, I made mention of the, the, the shape of the plasma cells are irregular and then um, the, the blood cell is hyperviscous and then there's excessive production of plasma cells. So the viscosity is actually um, in excess. So um, a plasma exchange can be done because it's actually, in the, it's actually the plasma that is affected. Then hemodialysis, if the patient meets the criteria for hemodialysis. So um, I, was, I will talk a little about multiple myeloma. So this is my um, the outline for multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma 
and another name for it is Kalas or myelomatosis. It was first uh, reported in England by Dr. William Matintyre, of which a patient presented with uh, fatigue, diffuse bone pain, and increased frequency of urination in 1850. Then it was then narrowed down to being named as myeloma, coined down to name as uh, myeloma in 1873 by Rudzinski. Uh, multiple myeloma is actually a, a malignant proliferative proliferation of plasma cells derived from a single clone involving more than 10% of, um, of um, the plasma cells in the bone marrow. So um, it actually ranges from a stable disease to a slow progressing disease to an end organ damage. Already this patient um, has a background end organ damage. So almost all the cases of multiple myeloma um, develop from a pre-existing monoclonal gamopathy undetermined um, significance, that's the MGOS. The MGOS is actually a pre-malignant um, um, asymptomatic state. So um, all of them um, who have come down with multiple myeloma have actually progressed from the MGOS and then um, progressed down to uh, multiple myeloma. The multiple myeloma actually is a, um, multiple myeloma cells produce monoclonal immunoglobulins that may be identified either in the serum or in the urine. So this is actually um, the abnormal cell. So this is the labeled one. Um, if we look well, the um, abnormal cells are, uh, are bigger than the normal. The abnormal plasma cells are actually bigger than the normal ones, both the nucleus, the cytoplasm, all of those are actually bigger. Sometimes they could be binucleated, they could be trinucleated. So I also have some more pictures of the binucleated and the trinucleated um, um, cells when we go down to so epidemiology. Multiple myeloma has been said to account for 1% of all cancers and amongst the hem hem hematologic malignancies that's said to, be, uh, to account for 10% of uh, hematological malignancies. It's actually the second most common hematological malignancy after chronic um, lymphocytic um, leukemia. And then it has new cases have been accounted for of about 70, 74,000 each year. But worldwide, we've had over 200,000 um, cases. So, um, yeah, so in Nigeria, coming down to Nigeria, we've had about 8.5 to 12.9% of hematological malignancies. And this has been said to um, um, cause an increase in the incidence due to all produ producing areas in Nigeria, like um, the river, river states, Bialsa state, Delta state, Akwaibom, and Cross River. It's been said that we have more of patients coming down with multiple myeloma due to um, exposure to um, the oil being produced in such regions. Um, multiple myeloma is commoner in uh, males as compared to females, of which our patient is a male. Um, it's higher in, in blacks than in, in whites. Then it's two times um, as common in blacks compared to the Caucasians. The mean age of diagnosis is 65 years. And then the mean age in Nigeria is actually 54 to 62, but our patient was actually 63 years, but that's actually is close to the mean age. Then MGOS is present in over 3% of the population above 50 years. Then MGOS progresses to MM, uh, multiple myeloma at a rate of approximately 1% per year, meaning that every year patients progress from MGOS to multiple myeloma at 1%, risk factors. We have a lot of risk factors, but uh, the precise etiology is unknown. Um, we have genetic factors of first degree relative, uh, of which um, this has been um, attributed to um, Paratag 7. Environmental sorry, factors um, are also been. Dr. Dr. Briggs, Dr. Briggs. Yes. Sorry for cutting you short. Please, can you just round off in two minutes okay. so that people can okay. start okay. asking okay. questions? Since you have this slide, you can post it and then people will go through it. At okay, so I would, free time. okay, okay. So pathogenesis, pathogenesis, um, it comes from the beta, um, beta cell lymphocytes, of which uh, we have um, the primary um, cytogenic abnormalities, where we have immunoglobulin H trans translocation, and then there's an uh, there's an abnormal response to this antigenic stimulus, and then it brings about what we call MGOS. Then with progression events, we have genetic lesions bone marrow uh, micro environments will now uh, further worsen the MGOS to um, patients coming down with multiple myeloma 
or which do have an end organ damage. So I just talked about um, the pathogenesis in that um, picture. So the clinical manifestations, I've already mentioned them, of which we all know. Um, the patients, right. okay, so now for, hello, sir. Yeah, so I think you've mentioned all these investigations during while well, you are treating this, this um, the question. So um, okay. we'll just post, you post the, the slides later. So um, let's just open the floor for questions, contributions, and clarifications. You can indicate by raising your hands or typing in the chat room. So the floor is open for contributions, clarifications, and and questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah, thank you Dr. Briggs, for a, a lucid presentation. Thank you. Thank it you. was really detailed. OK, um, Dr. Jamila, you can ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Briggs, for the very lucid presentation. Um, just an addition for patients with renal insufficiency, the um, linadlidomide or the talidomides are not usually the best choice, so they are replaced with cyclophosphamide, except these patients have um, a refractory disease, then you may consider that. So the first option would be the botezonib, cyclophosphamide, and the examethasone. Then for the infections, you, we talked about also vaccinations are also important in them, especially the pneumococcal um, vaccines. So that's also um, something they will benefit from. Then for the hypercalcemia, um, in addition to what you mentioned, um, the loop diuretics would also be used. And then if all these fail, a monoclonal antibody called denosumab can also be used in the patients with hypercalcemia. So thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll add it to the slide. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamila. Any other questions before I get to the chat box? Anyone? Just indicate by raising your hand. Okay, let me let me go to the chat box. Uh, okay, um, Dr. Momodu Jafar, say thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. Um, he has a comment, and his comment is that uh, he thinks it would have been better for drug-induced nephrotoxicity as a cause will be more appropriate. As we know, he had uh, nephrotoxic antibiotics. It could also be on an ACI um, as anti-hypertensive, anti which could worsen his renal state. Two, he also uh, thought of um, malaria nephropathy being a differential vis-a-vis -vis the endemicity. And then three, could be obstructive uropathy also as a differential diagnosis, either BPH or prosthetic um, cancer. Uh, the others are applauding your your presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll, I'll add that to the slide. I'll add it no. to the slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Momojo. Thank you. Um, any other contributions before our teachers come in? Any other contribution? Okay, uh, Dr. Christ, Christian Wariboko said the uh, xanthine oxidase inhibitors, not xanthine, xanthine oxidase too. So maybe it does. Yeah, um, I will notice. Thank you. Um, Antanimo is asking what of renal transplant? Do you offer yes. renal transplant in the patient? Um, if the patient meets the criteria, for renal transplants, although I didn't write, but it's actually supposed to be there. That's okay. at the end stage. Yeah. Any other contribution? Okay, back to our teachers. Any other any contributions from our teachers before we move to the next presentation?
serious now. I love that talk, Okute. Yes, ma. Can I be heard? Yes, you can be heard, ma. Yeah, before I call our dear chief Chito, I, I must commend Dr. Bridge. I hope I got the I'll be trying to pronounce it properly. Yeah, Dr. Bridge. Yes. 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 And she did so well. Our presentation mm. was lucid, so clear. Most of us got carried away. When she even as there 15 minutes, we're just listening to her. She made so much point. It was clear and she went straight to the point. But the only issue I had with her was time management. Okay. You to work on your time management. One of the essence of the class, not just to move stuff, but to move it fast enough for you to finish with this, within the time they give you in exam. And if you have time to quickly correct yourself, Say extra things because if you have more time than you're done, you still have like two minutes more. You can't continue. Remember, you said something that doesn't make sense. They said that, please, ma, ma, please. Can I go back and, and say this again? Most of them will allow you. So it's not for things to brush up and more maps. If you, even if you said everything, go back and say more. If you have 100 over 100 in that question, it's not a bad thing. You know, we we'll always preach, get as much mark as you can from each question, from each of the questions. So please work on your time management. That's just what I wanted to add. The other comment that he said, mentioned by the class, the guy that mentioned that this is a drug is used in property, my brother, my brother, I think you're a man, please, the, the presenter was spot on with that diagnosis. Because this is so that those that are listening to this and then people present for the discussion, they will not be confused when this question is repeated. The presenter diagnosis. So, but I must appreciate the comments. I love the participation. I'll please keep the comments coming. Preparing for this presentation is not easy. Please keep it coming. And I love the presenters so far, the attitude. Please keep it up. We intend to to make this slide more public than we're already doing. So please, you don't want to go back tomorrow and realize you see your video somewhere and um, you're not so proud of what you did. So please. But the class so far, everybody doing so well. So keep it up, keep up the energy. Chief Chitu, sir. Thank you, man. Oh, good morning, Dr. Christopher. Sorry, I got uh, a phone call came in earlier, so I couldn't uh, make my comment then. So, um, yes, the presenter did very well. But I want her to understand one or two things. And I want everyone here to also understand. Now, if you notice in the question, they never said chronic kidney disease. They said chronic insufficiency. Okay. okay. Now, okay, so. what that means is that this person has not met definition of CKD yet. But from the person's history, you can suggest that there is a drop in. You can suggest that there is a drop in the okay. person's renal function. Or there are features either in the history that would suggest that there is a drop in the patient's renal function. And that is a very key statement that we put, uh, put forward to us there. So when we're talking about this patient, do not, because the presenter said, oh, her first differential was um, uh, hypertension, okay, being the cause of the patient's um, insufficiency, which is a very good differential based on the fact that the person has been has had a systemic hypertension for over 20 years. You do know that if once somebody has had hypertension for over 15 years, then there is a risk of the patient developing uh, CKD from the hypertension. So, but when she was saying it, she mentioned CKD. Please avoid straying from the brief that has been put before you. Okay? It will okay, point so. out that you don't understand what CKD is. And the next thing could be, oh, can you define it? If it's a, even an examiner that wants to throw you off completely, you can start telling you to define CKD and all of that. And you know you don't have the information to call it uh, a CKD per se. It's uh, all set. Okay. okay. Um, then you did very well. Your discussion had everything we want, everything that needed. Okay. But please note that yes. in an exam setting, you will not. Uh, I have I'm privy that when this question came out in that exam, people struggled. As simple as it looks, people uh, struggled because everybody was expecting the common things that we see. Uh, uh, as causes of uh, uh, chronic insufficiency, 
affecting hypertension, diabetes, glomerulonephritis. Although this is well, this produces some form of glomerulonephritis in a secondary uh, manner. Okay, but people are expecting that, and a lot of people missed out on seeing multiple myeloma. Okay, but it should strike you immediately. But if you've not seen many of them, then you may uh, struggle uh, with it. So I want everyone here to know that when we, when most of the nephrology questions may be things that you don't see every day. But the good thing about nephrology is um, the questions we bring forward. As strictly, once you can, once you have any inkling about that disease entity, you know the component, it will, it will jump at you immediately. You know what it is. Okay, I think in the past they brought things like HUS and stuff like that. But, you know, there are nothing you see every day. But once you see the features, it will jump at you and you can see the answer. That's the good thing about it. Then um, finally, the um, when you were coming about the, uh, the management plan, the treatment plan for the patient, please always try and put it in categories. Okay? Start by saying, oh, the principles of management include, one, yes, you want to support the patient. Two, you want to try and um, treat the primary disease, which is the multiple myeloma. Then, of course, you also want to take care of complications, which includes, of course, the renal insufficiency and, of course, the uh, anemia and all of that, and the thrombocytopenia. So if you break it down into headings, okay, even if you don't finish all the discussion, you have said everything, you will get marked for everything. Okay, yes, the mark may not be complete, but you get marks for everything. So always try and break it down into smaller bits, okay, of headings. And it also helps you with the discussion. So you don't over talk about one um, at the expense of uh, the other uh, things you want to say, if you already arrange it in your head in, in the form of heading. Yes, but very well done, Dr. Briggs. You did very well. Thank you, sir. Thank yes. you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir, for your contribution, sir. Um, Hello. any other contribution? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, um, thank you, Chief Shutu, for your contribution. Um, unfortunately, I didn't start um, joining on time, so I didn't hear the question. But I don't know, I think somewhere along the line, I was expecting to hear something about um, monoclonal homopathy of renal significance. Uh, I'm not sure if I heard anything about it. Um, okay. I, I think she mentioned that when she was discussing multiple myeloma as a whole, but she didn't mention it as a differential, which is which is fair based on information. Okay. It's okay. I didn't hear the question very well. I just felt that it was an important um important part of it should be an important part of this discussion. All right, but thank you. Well done. Thank uh, you, sir. So um Thank you very much, Dr. 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 Kute, thank you. Yeah, thank you. You can you. Say that for, not thank the presenter, yeah, then thank, the thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Briggs, for the presentation. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, so you you share the slides in our okay. in our group. So okay, the next you. presenter, please. So stop sharing your slides so that the next presenter can share your slides. Thank you. Hello, class. Who is presenting next? Who is ready with his or her own presentation? Dr. Anthony. Hello. I'm not ready. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, this is Dr. Victor. Okay. Um my mine is uh, with the National uh, College. I don't know if I can take it or are we doing West Africa first? 
Okay. Well, this is for simul- simultaneously. So any college that is ready, you don't yes. want to waste the time. Exactly. So so if if you're ready with your slides, you can you can start okay. sharing and then just start your presentation. All right, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Okay, can you can you see my slide? Hello, good we morning. We can see it. We can see it. Yes. Go ahead. All right. So I'll be taking um question seven. It's uh, under ethics and uh, communication. Um. Good morning, teachers. Good morning, colleagues. I'm Dr. Victor Kenuba. I'll be taking um question seven of the um, last November uh, 2023 um, fellowship exams from the National College. So it goes like this. A 50-year-old university lecturer, not a known hypertensive or diabetic, who had stroke previously and has been regular on medications, now presented with a real stroke, left-sided hemiplegia, but no dysatria or dysphagia. He said, your drugs are not working. I will sort for an alternative care and you don't know what you are doing. Okay, so question A says, what concept are you going to apply in talking to this patient? He said, what are the first things you will say to the patient? He said, um, some candidates were asked, what is the principle of communication applied and define the principle? He says a candidate said he mentioned empathy and he was asked to define empathy. Okay, the next question is the patient asked, why did he have a repeat stroke? That's okay. Yes, good morning. That's okay, sorry to sorry to interrupt your flow of thought. Um, yes. Anything on then there are some questions that we need simulators and timekeeper so that to simulate the real exam situation. You know when you're presenting history taking, presenting ethics, it's not really okay. the same as uh, having somebody doing it with you. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Dr. Atta, over to you. We need a simulator. We need a timekeeper. Okay. Um, Dr. Christabel, I will simulate. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hello. Jamila. <clears throat> Dr. Jamila. Hello. Dr. Jamila, yes. can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yes. Be the timekeeper. I'm actually oh. driving. Yeah. Okay. So be the yeah. How many minutes? Chief Ma, how many minutes do we give him? We give, give we give him five minutes. <laughs> no, let's give him let's give him seven. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. From seven minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay, so your time starts now, please. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, I'm Dr. Ken Uba, uh, a senior registrar with the, the unit that is um, treating you, the neurology unit, and I've been asked to talk with you about some concerns that you have. Um, are you comfortable um, the way you are? I'm comfortable. Okay, do you want anyone to uh, be with, with you as we talk with us, as you talk with me? Do you want no, maybe your personality? I, I can discuss, I can discuss the issues myself. Okay, all right, thank you, sir. So um, I would like to know what I, what's, what's your um, concern? What's, what, what's your, pro, uh, what challenge do you have? Can you share with me? Well, I, I feel that you people don't know what you're doing. Hmm? I had a stroke. In the past, you people started me on management. You said if I follow it to the letter, that I won't, uh, I won't have any problems. I will improve. Now I'm back with another weakness. I don't understand. Now they're telling me I have another stroke. I don't understand what you guys are doing. So what's the point? 
Okay, so I'm I'm actually so sorry, so sorry that uh, you you had another stroke. Uh, things didn't actually go the way we 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 expected, but you know I would like to explain certain things uh, to you concerning this stroke. But I want to first of all say that you are, I'm really really sorry about what happened. And we share. It's probably, it's probably going to fix my problem. Is it going to give me back my movement in my left arm and my left leg. Is that what uh -uh. it's going to do? I'm so sorry, sir. But I want an yes, explanation sir. about this. I would like to just uh, give you some explanations about you. Please, can you just pay, pay some close attention to, to me while I explain uh, certain things? I should, I should about... pay attention to you. So I, was, I was not paying attention before. I oh, oh, so sorry, sir. Okay, let me just go ahead and can I give you some information about it? Go ahead. I'm listening. All right, sir. All right, sir. Um, the thing about um, stroke is that um, when it happens, you know, it's a uh, stroke is of a sudden onset uh, of uh, weakness. It's a sudden onset of weakness on one side of the body, usually due to a vascular or you know, the blood vessels that uh, see, supply what, what the brain. You've come. You've come again. What are blood vessels, please? All right. The 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 channel. Blood vessels are channels that uh, supply blood to different parts of the body. You have different pipes. Like DSTV or what? No, like pipes, pipes that uh, supply uh, blood to different parts of the body. So when okay. a stroke occurs, it uh, it they, they, there's a, an obstruction of that pipe. The, there are two kinds of stroke. It's either the pipe can burst or that pipe can be clogged. But anyway, anyway the, the, the pipe is, uh, the supply of blood is obstructed to that part of the brain. And when is there obstruction to that part of the to the brain, there can be weakness on any side on the side of the body. So um, the the thing about strokes is that once it happens, the chances of it happening again are usually increased. For any individual that has it the first time, the time chances of it happening again is increased. If studies have shown that in the first one year about um, 15%, five to 15% of persons that had strokes, that uh, yeah, they have it in that first year again. And over five years, it goes as much as 18 to 20% of those persons that had stroke the first time, they have a repeat stroke within the next five years. So um, despite all treatments, despite all treatments, it's been said that most of the strokes that occur, 23% of strokes that occur are actually repeat strokes. Every year, 23% of strokes that occur are actually repeat strokes. So repeat strokes are usually common, are very common in our environment, despite good treatments. But I understand that you have been taking your medications, you have been taking your uh, aspirin, your statins. These drugs are actually good. Um, statins are shown to reduce um, risk of stroke by about 25%, and uh, um, uh, aspirin have been shown to reduce strokes by the risk of stroke for, by another 25%. So they have their percentage uh, reduction of uh, repeat stroke that um, it has been shown that they actually reduce uh, strokes, the risk of a repeat stroke by these uh, percentages, which are good. But with all these things, we still find out that some of our patients still may still have a repeat uh, stroke. I understand that your blood pressure was also um, um, your, your you had you had good blood pressure control. Even with a good blood pressure control, uh, strokes can still reoccur. Do you understand me, sir? Yeah. Although okay. many of the things you said, you were just talking numbers. I don't. I want to know what's going yeah. on. With you. I, I just wanted me to be familiar uh, with the fact that repeat strokes do occur, this, despite uh, being treated by the best hands. So um, I want to, we want to chart a course, chart a way forward. We want to see how we can solve this uh, challenge, this problem uh, that is on ground now. I understand you are- You have one left. minute more. Okay. You have one minute more, please. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I understand that you are a university lecturer and uh, yeah. you 
I'm still. Uh, are you are you right-handed or left-handed, sir? I'm right-handed. Okay, right-handed. Okay, so it's we we are grateful that. Uh, well, you it's, it's your left side that was affected, so you can still write with your right hand. So we we'll want to engage you, rehabilitate you. We want to ensure that uh, you do your physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is is very good, and uh, you can still I'm go back. Physiotherapy the first time, so I go back again and go through all that page again. Ah, people have not done well. I'm so sorry, but we'll uh, we'll be with you in all this. We'll also. Will be with you uh, just to encourage. That's why I'm here to just encourage you. So uh, physiotherapy is just the option that you you have. It's just the only option right now. Once a stroke okay. has so happened, what, what, wouldn't I have another stroke? Would you not have since you told me that regardless of whatever is happening to me, I can still have stroke. So it means I can have another one, another one after that, another one after that. It's so, time of the seven minutes plus. No, that's let him complete this. Okay. Segment. Okay. Uh, 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 yes, sir. Well, that 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 that's the um, unfortunate reality. The reality is that the the more the strokes happen, the uh, increased chances of them happening again. But with your treatment and with your compliance with your medications, you you still reduce your chances of happening again of the the stroke happening again. So I still want to encourage you to keep taking your medications, your antiplatelet drugs, your uh, statins, your BP medications, and they will investigate you further to see if there were other possible causes of the stroke happening because uh, uh, they have so, been you know, So that means you didn't investigate me well the first time? Uh, no, 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 sir, but we will we want to just investigate you more. We did actually investigate you, but we would like to just do some other investigations. In some rare conditions, there may be one or two things that may be mi missed. You may be having one of the rare conditions that uh, are not uh, that predispose you to having a stroke. So, we want to investigate you uh, to pick up those rare conditions. I hope you understand, sir. Uh, I understand some of the things you said, but I'm still not impressed. I would like to say that we are with you all the way. You know, we will be with you. As you are doing your physiotherapy, uh, you are, we want to encourage you to also read up on on uh, the stroke, or you can check up materials online. So you're giving me, you're uh, giving me assignment to go and find out my test. Uh, uh, no, sir, but it's also good for you to have some knowledge. Uh, you know, I thought, you be the one, I thought you'd be the one to give me the information. So I don't get misled online. You can read all sorts of things online. Uh, yes, I will. We'll still have other meetings. That All right. Would, uh, I think we should round up here so that we don't. Okay. The time. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, sir. All right. All right. Well done. Okay. So we'll open up the floor to questions. I think there were questions that followed it, Ami. Yes. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. So what concepts are you going to apply in talking to this patient? Okay, for the concepts, uh, we want to apply the um, since it's an ethical station, ethics station, uh, autonomy, um, uh, non maleficent benevolence, and uh, beneficence and uh, justice. Uh, we also want to be empath empathetic with our patients because uh, it's a sad situation. And we want to uh, um, empathize with him to put ourselves in his in his place. So I think that's uh, the concept that I want to apply. Okay. And what are the first things you want to say to the patient? Was that asked as a separate question, or uh, was that part of part of the counseling? That is how the question came. <laughs> You said, what are the first things you want to say to the patient? So, so what are the first things you want you would want to say to the patient? Okay, you already said it already, so yeah, we have yeah. that already. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, then the patient asked, why did he have a pit stroke despite his compliance? Explain to the patient why, so which you've done. Okay, so we can close the floor with the question clarification. Chief Chitusa, Dr. Fatima yes. has a yes. comment. 
Okay, well, please. Okay, you go ahead, Dr. Fatima. I can't see the hand, Dr. Mm -hmm. I was looking at by. All right, okay. yeah. Dr. Fatima. Good go morning, ahead. Yeah, good morning to Chito. Uh, good morning to Christabel. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Oh, I don't know. Sorry, I, I can't find the name. Um, for the presenter, thank okay. you. Um, so actually, I want to share my experience in these exams. Um, uh, the issue is they want to avoid using simulators in the exams because they believe all of us know all the steps <laughs> in doing this. So there was actually no simulator in the exams. These questions were asked the way they, we uh, recall them. There was no simulator in the exam. The questions were highly subjective. Whatever answer you gave, they will say that is not one they want to hear. So you just just be bitten around the book saying everything you know about ethics and communication until you are lucky to get what is in their mind. So it was actually not a straightforward question. It's very difficult to understand so what they actually You are not want. asking, no, you weren't asking anybody anything. It was the examiners you were just talking to. So you said? I said there was nobody seated that you were talking to. You no, were just no, talking no, to no, the examiners. No, no. There are, yes, it's only the two examiners and okay. you, the uh, candidate, there was no uh, patient or simulator. Okay. Okay. It's becoming clearer now. Yeah. Thank okay. you. All right. Well, they, uh, is there anybody else's hand up before we dive into it and sort it out? Dr. Chitu, sir, let me just comment on yeah. that quickly. Okay. Chitu, sir. Yes, go yes, ahead, ma'am. Um, I see things simulator or not. Let's do things the proper way so we can train a candidate for the exam. Because they may not have been simulator. It may just be because national don't have money. People are not going for this exam. So they may not have had money or they might not have gotten a simulator for that um, particular question or something happened, really. So, because the usual thing when it comes to ethics, and even if there, there is even no simulator, the uh, examiners become your simulator in a way, just like Chief Chief exactly. Chief exactly. Chief simulator to the candidate. So it's better, I look at him, I remember when Kenumba was praying to the teacher, he was like, I'm going to wow everybody, I'm, I have stuff. But when he was asked to, when he was given a simulator, he changed. I love this um, confidence. It, when Chief Chitu was shifting him left, right, center, the guy maintained, even though he, he gave him in few cases, but you could see that at ease. He can't sell people, so you know how to, to avoid them. Because <laughs> some comments uh, Chief Chitu made did show him off balance. He became recovered. So it shows that it's something he does. So you never can tell anything can happen as well. So let's nice, um, let I appreciate Dr. Fatima for telling us the reality on ground. I really appreciate that. So thank you, Dr. Fatima. Thank you, Chief Chitu. Thank you, our dear candidate. Chief Chitu, uh, sir. So, yes, so thank you, Dr. Christopher. So I think this particular station, I think what they were trying to do here, and the funny thing is that this is what this is the type of stations I tend to put in front of my medical students here in my center. Uh, most of the ethics stations, I don't put a simulator there. I am the simulator. So I'm expecting them to do certain things or perform say certain things, show empathy, do all of that um, at the station. So I guess they were doing a similar thing. So even though you were not going through the motions of an actual uh, simulation, okay, you in the back of your mind, you should play a simulation of how you would want that particular discussion to go if there was a real patient, okay? And that would help you uh, focus on this. Uh, it looked like you were dealing with a patient that had the, uh, had the possibility of being difficult, okay? And a patient that has uh, had a repeat condition which was not anticipated, okay? And uh, the patient uh, is not happy about it, okay? And that's why they were asking you all this, what concept would you want to apply and all of that. So it, it's... Um, I wouldn't say it's a form of conflict resolution, I'd say, but you're dealing with a difficult patient. And of course, you still have to go through the, uh, all those stages of when we do counseling and we say spike. Okay, all those are important. Now, 
in dealing with this patient, the principle you're going to have to use is the principle that we don't tend to talk about. It's not one of those, one of the uh, four or five major principles of veracity. Okay, where you're trying to build trust and you're trying to be honest with your patient. Okay, and that is the principle you're going to have to use to unlock this particular um, question. And of course, you have to come with a lot of empathy. Okay, um, the first thing, of course, is that the patient is going to attack you, saying that, oh, you told me this will not happen again. And you told me that if I follow all of this, 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 the chances of this happening again is low and all of that. Yeah, but you have to point out to the patient that, look, all that we gave you, or all that the treatments we are giving you, and all the preventive measures, secondary preventive measures that we started, are not to, yeah, they reduce your chances, but they would not reduce it to zero. So there is a chance just that it is reduced, okay? And because it's had a second stroke does not mean it's gonna have a third one and fourth one, okay? And you cannot really promise the patient that another one will not happen. And I did like the way the speaker was calm and was able to try and point this out, but there were too many medical jargon. And that's why I kept taking the bath. As much as possible when you're trying to build trust and you're trying to be honest with your patient, you, as much as, patient, as much as possible, don't try and make it look like you're trying to hide something from your patient. So you would want a situation where you're using language that is uh, understood by the person, one. And then two, you're using, you're, you're saying it in a very short and brief manner, not a long explanation. You don't need statistics, you don't need all of that. All you need to tell the patient is, yes, you've had a show before because you have certain risk factors. We are managing those risk factors. However, the possibility of having a stroke is not zero, but we can reduce it significantly. Okay? If all those things you did were followed. And of course, you knew that you were very compliant and you followed all those things. Now, it is unfortunate that it has happened, but we will get on top of it and perhaps even look for more things that we can control to further even reduce that risk. Things that we didn't look at before that were not glaring before for us to look at. Now we may have to look deeper, okay, to figure out other things that may still put you at risk of having a stroke. So all you're doing is reassuring the patient that you're going to, you know, as much as possible, prevent another one, okay, and try and manage the current um, situation of things. I think that is why they didn't put a simulator there, because it is a bit complex to teach a simulator all of this. Uh, I think those are the... Uh, particular issue. But uh, the presenter did well, okay? But although he did not try and uh, identify who I was, okay, to confirm oh. what I do for a living, to be oh. sure that English is the preferred language of discussion. He didn't ask oh. me how I wish to be addressed, okay? And oh. some of those early uh, things that we tend to ask the patient before we go into the gist. Okay, and then you don't ask your patient to go and read. You give the patient the information. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. I'll give you info. I'll give you a few information about this, this, this. We will still have more discussions together to, you know, to discuss your concern and all of that. Okay. Or you did delve out the fact that one of my concerns is that I'm I'm afraid it will happen again, which you try to address at some point in the discussion. Okay. You also did ask for my feedback as we were moving along. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, but you did show a lot of empathy. You didn't raise your voice. You didn't get angry. Okay. So, which yes. is uh, the ideal thing to do if there was a real um, simulator at the station. Um, I think those are the my contributions on this particular topic. I don't know if any of the uh, consultants present have other things to add. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful, a wonderful clarification, sir. So, if any other, any other contribution from our teachers or from any other person, then you can raise your hand or type the chat box. So, hello. Um, yes, I hope, you, sir. Yeah. Um, I always love kind of um, stations. Um, we are shifting away from doctor-centered care, care. 
days is fish on the dock longer, long time. It's stick error. So the patient is concerned, must always be a doctor. So yeah, this patient has very angry with us. Um, I'm not sure what him initially that oh if you take all these medications you'll be fine that those are the way we flip out um patients so, um because we always like come down with the stroke we say patients gotten that um gotten that also each that even if if the person is taking medication, stroke is still on, especially if so. So, uh, so the, uh, the I must say that the did a very good job, okay? And she has pointed out many of these. However, I still have issues with the concept I'm not sure we've done well. I don't know what the to me, I don't even know what but I feel as if we have not got yet. Is this I didn't, I didn't, talk, I didn't understand the concept they meant. So I guess it's something they may have taught in one of the update courses, but I didn't was, understand what they meant by concept. But well, so, uh, in, in actually just um she in conflict solution, but now as no, more like it's not really conflict. It's like dealing with an angry patient, but the concept behind it, so I don't know. I don't know that concept is. I mean, uh, I don't know what that concept. Is. I feel as if the is not the concept. It's just of discussing with patients. Okay, and then as you know, all things like conciliation. I don't know, but it's not really obligatory, you know, because you try to pacify, pacify somebody, and um, you know, we are not at all. But it's also possible that we are within education, like um, you know, counseling um, about secondary. We didn't mention the possibility. Even despite everything, there's still a chance of a future. Because I'm not sure that so with us, we're not there. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I, I still feel as if there's something missing, even though I don't know what it is. So um, maybe other people can get it out. But just as Chief Shito said, please, as much as possible, Use the simplest terms possible to explain this patient. Then don't be giving them assignments like uh, go and get this, go and read this. Myself as a doctor, you never read now. Your patient they tell me go read. Abba. So <laughs> can I say, well, I will um, I'll provide you with something like this or um this material so please that might help you understand much more. And then always make sure you book another point at the end of your discussion. And that you know is a continuous thing. Counseling is continuous. Establish that before you end the session. Because okay, so these are the things that are there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir, for your contribution, sir. Any other contributions from our teachers? Uh, thank you. Thank you, and um, Dr. Um, Atta, there are some comments in the chat, but let me just quickly make my contribution. And uh, we, it was six minutes past eight, so I'll try to keep it brief. Thank you, the presenter. It was a fair attempt, really. You tried, really. Um, please, when you're doing ethics station, some form of counseling, some form of um, counseling and history taking, sometimes you bring in support group and let them know that, um, that they should join support group. And since that's your specialty, you can just say, ah, please, I'll add you to a WhatsApp group with people. You, in your exam, you pretend as if, you know, this is the ideal thing. This is what, actually, that's what we're supposed to do. So I'll add you to a WhatsApp group of people 
that um, has similar conditions with you, so you you hear their stories. I believe it will motivate you. If there's already an established one outside the hospital, so I'll share the contact with you with the organizers that you join them. The clinical psychologists will come in here. Then this is a chronic condition. You don't know. We're talking about drug compliance and the rest. Is this guy being able to 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 buy these drugs? So you ask him support. Who is your support? Eh? Your church, um, your your mosque, um, family, friends, people that can support you. Is or linking up with lecturer, uh, chief, chief, even with our doctors now. <laughs> there are some conditions we have. It drains your resources completely. So if they're from a single company that could give these drugs at a discounted rate, so fine, we'll link you up with them to give you these drugs at a discounted rate. <laughs> Chief, you just go. That's why we bring all these concepts so that you just touch on all of them briefly, quickly, so that you just do well on an aspect of the exam. So that you pick all the marks as much as as much as possible. Then um, I think that's about that. Chief, I said everything. Uh, so please, Dr. Atta, please help us read the comments so that we okay. close the class. All right, thank you, thank you very much, Ma, for your contribution. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Victor, for for attempting to answer those the questions and bring yourself forward to answer those questions. So the contribution from the chat box, uh, Dr. Dr. Um, Success is ethics station. You did not apply the spikes uh, model. Uh, Dr. Ifoma say, I think further evaluation of causes of recurrent stroke is a mainstay of this discussion. Um, Dr. Success said, did you try to find out what the patient mean by being compliant? He may not even be taking the medication judiciously. Also note that the lifestyle modification and rehabilitations are key to preventing reoccurrence. Uh, Dr. Mwata said, I believe the communication should be two-way. Ask, tell, ask, tell. Apart from spikes, the ICE model should be addressed to ideas, concern, and expectations. So these are the these are the comments, the few comments that are in the chat box. Thank you for your contributions to today's class. I'll I'll hand over to the our teachers to close the class for us today. Sorry, please. Uh, hello, Chief Christopher. Are we making that yes. uh, stuff today, or we are waiting for you some other time? Uh, I think we'll, there's always time to make. We want the management okay. to be first to be aware. Um, okay. The management is not aware yet. Okay. So I don't want them to hear it in the air like this. So let right. the management just call or let the management know. They were announced okay. in the class subsequently. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I love your enthusiasm. So wonderful. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, sir. So thank you, Dr. Atta. Thank you so much. I love the way you stepped in to the big shoes of Dr. Kopi and Dr. Fatima so beautifully. Thank you so much. Shows that what Dr. Kopi said, you are it and more. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate you. I believe uh, once the national you, candidate um, close their registration, we'll get you um, a partner to work with you. Once a partner from the National College, but so far, so good. This is your first time and you did so well. Thank you for anchoring the class and organizing the class. Thank you so much. Our teachers, Chief Chitu, Chief Cookie, Chief Amigus, Chief Manza, um, Chief uh, Bansi, Nasencha, um, all our consultants are present in the call, Dr. Kopi, Dr. Fatima, Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to class. Our participants, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you don't come to class, who are we going to teach? Thank you. And our wonderful presenters today, really, Dr. Briggs, Dr. Ekele Robert, Dr. Ken, and um, Dr. Siri have set the pace. Please, let's not go beyond this, uh, this bar. They set it so high. I'm sure the other candidates can do much more. Let us maintain this tempo of uh, 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 participation. Thank you so much. Chief Chitu, sir. Chief Chitu, please pause yeah, the class, Thank sir. you. OK, thank you, Dr. Um, Christopher. It's been a nice morning. Uh, we've overshot the time for no long discussion. Uh, well done, Dr. Briggs. Well done, uh, Dr. I think Dr. Ken, I think. Uh, well done. You guys spoke well. And I, I do like the way that you guys handled both questions. 
uh, if we're already like that now, imagine how we'll be in the next one or two months. So um, uh, for those already submitting their dissertations to me, please note that it should be in the um, uh, it should be in a PDF format. Okay, so please be sure it's in a PDF format before sending it. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So I wish everybody a wonderful morning. Tomorrow is another day. Well done to our new class rep. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. So everyone, okay, thank, thank you for sir. coming to class. Thank you. Thank for you. Coming. All right. So have a great day, everyone. Right. Bye bye.